Bangladesh recently celebrated 50 years of nationhood. But many changemakers say that's just the beginning. We should create something that where the whole world would come to Bangladesh and see. From business innovations. Very soon we're going to be competing with some of the best. To creative passions. Every day I wake up with a new dream, with a new design in my mind. We'll meet the men and women who, inspired by tradition, already have their sights set on new frontiers. is home to one of the world's fastest growing economies. Labour-intensive manufacturing in sectors like ready-made garments fuels this success. But to carry that momentum forward, some experts say that innovation is key, an attitude that entrepreneurs across the country are adopting. We developed these bags, which is totally biodegradable, environment-friendly, no plastics inside, no microplastics and carbon emission negative. This could be the really shopping bag alternative to plastic bags. Bangladeshi scientist Mubarak Ahmed Khan developed this plastic alternative with the help of these plants, which are used to produce jute. It's one of the strongest natural fibers and it's predominantly grown in South Asia. A major cash crop of Bangladesh, jute can be spun into a variety of products from packaging materials to baskets to rugs. Khan, however, believes that the fibre's true potential lies not in what it can be crafted into, but what can be derived from it. Jute content is 70% cellulose. Jute's potential is that all over the world. You cannot find any crops like jute which contain 70% cellulose. At this moment, cellulose is very, very important. Cellulose is the main component of plant fibres and many experts believe it can potentially serve as an alternative to plastic. Khan has dedicated over a decade to exploring these eco-friendly properties, resulting in this bag. He calls it Sonali, which means golden in Bengali, a nod to the fibre from which it's made. Khan says his Sonali bag breaks down in about six months, as opposed to plastic bags, which can take at least two decades to biodegrade in the ocean. My wish to protect the whole global from plastic pollution. If we can use these uh, jute products, then we can reduce the plastic pollution. Right now, Khan says his factory has the capacity to produce one ton of Sonali bags per day. He's still searching for financial backing, though, to take the bag commercial. But in the meantime, the pandemic inspired him to pivot, developing jute-based personal protective equipment and masks. And he believes this is only the beginning. There is versatile use of jute. It is really got gifted materials for Bangladeshi peoples. Jute is one of Bangladesh's oldest industries, and it's not the only traditional trade that's experiencing a shake-up. I'm working as a tea estate manager. I'm always studying tea, and it's my dream to try to create something new in it. In Bangladesh, it's virtually impossible to see friends, start some work, or have a family meal without a cup of tea. The industry dates back to 1854 under British rule and commercial production started here in the northeastern corner of the country called Silet. The areas of Silet are hilly and the weather conditions are appropriate for tea gardens. 92% tea production of total of Bangladesh comes from Silet. For that reason, Silet is called the tea capital of Bangladesh. According to Nasser Uddin Khan, Silet is home to 136 tea gardens. He manages one here called Brindabon, and he says that it's a 102-year-old operation that's spread out over nearly 1,200 acres. Black tea is the most popular variety produced on the estate, but last year, Khan decided to experiment. 
Besides black tea, I have made seven kinds of tea. Among them, yellow tea is sold for the highest price, as it is very familiar and popular with the people. Nobody makes this kind of tea in Bangladesh. Yellow tea originated in China. It's derived from the same plants as black or green tea, but the production is more labor intensive because the leaves have to be wrapped for days at a time. When I made this tea for the first time, I was researching more and more, doing it experimentally. Many people called me mad. After months of experimenting, the hard work paid off. Khan says his yellow tea was the first to be produced in Bangladesh. In March 2021, it sold for about $96 a kilo. That's roughly five times the price of green tea that was sold at the same time. I hope this yellow tea of Bangladesh will reach everyone around the world. Everyone will get the news. And I will believe I can give something to Bangladesh's tea industry. In terms of cultivating cutting-edge ideas, Bangladesh still has a long road ahead. According to the 2021 Global Innovation Index, an annual report from a United Nations agency which examines a country's capacity for innovation, Bangladesh ranks 116th out of 132. That position on the list has remained exactly the same for the past three years. But if entrepreneurs continue to experiment, that ranking could rise, paving the way for the country's economic future to be as prosperous as its past. There were those who said it was a dream. And yet, independence made the dream come true. Today, in the biggest delta on Earth, one of the fastest growing GDPs is a reality. Because here, medicine, food and garments for the world are made. For the year of the Golden Jubilee celebration of independence, the dream has never been more real. Because dreams are made in Bangladesh. Bangladesh's GDP grew nearly 7% annually between 2011 and 2019, according to the Asian Development Bank. The booming economy isn't just financially enriching the nation, it's also ushering in a new era of social change. Our garden is located in the very northern tip of Bangladesh. It's an area where there wasn't a lot of agriculture and no tea at all. It was very barren, and when we first there, everyone said nothing can grow here. Over the past two decades, Kazi Anis Ahmed's family converted the landscape into the Kazi and Kazi Tea Estate, the only USDA-certified organic tea garden in Bangladesh. He credits regenerative and organic agriculture for this transformation. Here, composting replaces chemical pesticides and fertilizers, and biogas helps power the estate. With a lot of soil enrichment, we created the conditions where tea could be planted. It has turned into this tremendous journey of regenerative agriculture. And we have ended up actually creating an entire ecosystem. Today, on these three and a half thousand acres, seven different varieties of tea are grown. Ahmed says about a quarter of this tea is exported under a label called Tea Tulia, one of Bangladesh's most well-known international tea brands. But when the company formed in 2000, Ahmed says that the local community was the priority. My father was already doing other business in that area. It used to be one of the poorest districts 20 years ago. And that's why we felt it was important to do something there that would create economic uh, opportunities for the people who live there. The business set out to achieve this by both employing locals at the tea garden and setting up a cooperative with neighboring residents. The co-op lends cows to women like Selena Khatoon, who can sell dairy products and keep the profit. They do this in exchange for giving cow dung back to the garden, which is used to create organic fertilizer. So far, I have taken eight cows from the co-op. Some helped me earn a profit and buy lands. 
In 2008, this cooperative started with just 25 women. By now, we have over 3,500 active members, so it has been a real life changer for them, but it has been a vital support for us to keep growing as an organic tea garden. There's no doubt that Ahmed's tea estate has not only transformed the physical landscape, but also the surrounding community. Across the country, entire industries are having similar effects. The ready-made garment sector, for instance, has significantly benefited women. That's according to the World Bank. We have played a huge role in empowering the women of our country whereby they've been able to come out of their homes in the villages whether they have education or not we've taught them skills which have helped them uh, to become independent Vidya Amrit Khan is one of the few women running a garment factory in Bangladesh her ties to the industry run deep her father is often heralded as a ready-made garment pioneer Having established in 1977, the company responsible for the country's first export factory. My father was a civil servant. He was a freedom fighter. He was always looking to find ways in which the people of our country could be employed and find a livelihood. We had a few nationalized industries. We didn't have much more than that. In the 40 years since Khan's family helped set up the industry, over 4,600 garment factories have sprung up, employing about 4 million people. Most of these workers are women, but as of 2018, less than 1% of female employees in Bangladesh have managerial positions or higher, according to the International Labour Organization. We are still a male-dominated economy. The son usually takes over, or the husband takes over, or the father uh, runs the show. So I broke that mold. Khan has been trying to pay it forward. Although the majority of managers at Desh are men, she says 28% are women. Like Jana Rani Day, who leads a team of over 80 people. The ready-made garment industry's growth has helped increase work opportunities for women and reduce poverty. But with that growth, there were growing concerns about health and safety standards, especially after the 2013 collapse of the Rana Plaza factory, which housed several garment factories. The tragedy claimed over 1,100 lives and left more than 2,500 injured, the majority of whom were women. When Rana Plaza took place, that was a tragedy, no doubt. But everybody came together, all the stakeholders, and we made all the corrections that needed to be done. We did the fire, the electrical, and of course the structural improvements. Although the ready-made garment sector is often the path for women to formally enter the workforce, the industry still has a long road ahead in terms of achieving gender equality. But if the country hopes to see continued growth and progress, some experts say help from the private sector will be key. Vitalizing communities to creating opportunities for women. Bangladeshi businesses have shaped many aspects of daily life. The opposite can also occur with local trends transforming commerce. Riding a bicycle in Dhaka is uh, an adventure itself. I love cycling for a couple of reasons. It's a lifestyle that helps me uh, to be most effective both in my day job and also to keep me fit and to become the best version of myself. Mozamal Haq is the founder of BD Cyclists. Today, he says the community is over 130,000 members strong and the country's largest recreational biking group. A number Hart could never have imagined in the beginning. When we were starting, the cycles that uh, we found over here uh, 
in local markets, they were not meant for uh, regular heavy duty riding. You couldn't really rely on them. We found that the parts were breaking apart, sometimes the chain broke apart, some, uh, many times the tires were not holding up. We used to call them BSOs, like bicycle shaped objects rather than a real bicycle. So that was sort of a hindrance at, back at that time for the community to grow. Luckily for the group, a local bike manufacturer was ready to listen to the community's concerns. BD cyclists, they've really changed the bicycle industry in Bangladesh. The founder especially, they, he helped me a lot to learn about what the bicycle needs are in the local market. And I tried to cater to their needs. Rashika Rahman Mahin was well positioned to provide solutions thanks to his family business. In 1974, his grandfather started what would become the Megna Group, making bicycle spokes with just 12 employees. Today, it's the largest bike manufacturer in Bangladesh. Mahin says the company produces about 700,000 bikes a year, which are mainly sold under European brand names in Germany, Denmark and the UK. When Mahin joined the company in 2011, these exports inspired an idea. So I would always tell my father that we're making such high quality bikes for other brands. I think we're capable of doing something on our own. So I decided to start my own brand. This brand is called Belos, and it launched in 2014. Unlike the majority of Megna's bikes, it's one of the first Bangladeshi branded bicycles. In the beginning, it was only sold domestically. Everyone around me discouraged me because um, bicycle was not that popular in Bangladesh. But I wanted to start small and hopefully make it grow. Initially, Mahin says the brand sold about 500 bikes a month. Now the company makes up to 5,000 sales monthly. Velos is a brand that I am proud of, especially. Uh, it started from Bangladesh, and I wish them very good luck in their future journey. BD cyclists didn't just impact the journey for Velos. The community has also helped cultivate an entire ecosystem based on biking culture. Park says, for instance, that before dedicated bike repair outlets like this existed in Dhaka, riders had to rely on rickshaw shops. But soon, a symbiotic relationship was born. As the community was growing, at the same time, the cycling shops and service centers were growing together, complementing each other and helping this culture, this community to grow. Bangladesh's manufacturing-based economy has been booming for decades. But as the country looks towards the future, a new generation is bolstering the arts and culture sector. Our art scene is very vibrant and we need to be recognized and known for our art. And we can't be ignored anymore. Nadia Samdani is one of Bangladesh's most prominent art philanthropists. For years, she's traveled the world, attending art festivals and fairs. As her private collection grew, so too did her concerns about homegrown creatives. I never saw the presence of Bangladesh. And it, I felt bad. I felt that, you know, how, how is this even possible? We have so many artists. We have so many exhibitions in Bangladesh. So many things are happening, but why are they not in international fairs. That question inspired the Dhaka Art Summit. Launched in 2012, the free event takes place every two years. Samdani says it's one of South Asia's largest art events, featuring nine days of exhibitions, workshops and talks. According to her, around 300 artists participate and in 2020, almost half a million visitors attended. Most were Bangladeshi, but the number of foreign guests has also grown over the years. In 2018, we had almost 1,200 international visitors. That is actually, I think, one of the highest visited for one single event. Dhaka Art Summit works as a bridge, connecting Bangladesh to the international world. Dhaka Art Summit, uh 
it was my dream to participate there because artists can have the exposure to the world. Shoma Shirobi Junat is a Dhaka based multimedia artist who mainly works outdoors. My work is about that how we can cultivate our senses through the relationship with nature. I see myself as a bridge to connect different aspects of life and want to create hope and kind of an optimistic lifestyle. Janat participated in the summit's most recent edition in 2020. She won the event's flagship prize, which awarded her with a six-week residency in London. In Bangladesh, the art market is not uh, it's not developed yet. But when you are participated in such kind of uh, platform, and uh, people from all over the world they come to see your artwork, it is life changing. COVID-19 delayed the next summit by a year. It's been rescheduled to 2023. But in a different creative sector, one designer says the pandemic was actually a boon for business. Due to the pandemic, the country borders were closed and people who were uh, uh, used to go for shopping to other countries, uh, during this time they couldn't, so they have to trust the fashion Bangladesh fashion industry. Sonia Musa is a Dhaka-based designer whose brand features luxury saris and dresses. Unlike the ready-made garment industry, which focuses on mass production, Musa is part of a growing group of Bangladeshi fashion designers dedicated to high-end tailoring. Within the last eight years, this sector saw the launch of the country's first fashion week, first Couture Fashion Week and the Fashion Design Council of Bangladesh. Bangladesh uh, fashion market is growing rapidly and getting very competitive day by day. Fashion brands like mine, we are working on selective designs for selective people. Musa has been in business for four years, first launching the brand in her home garage. Her only fashion experience was the years she spent designing dresses as a hobby for family and friends. From my early age, I wanted to study in fashion designing, but I ended up studying law because my father wanted me to do so. That was his dream. But fashion was my dream. I will, I will. Today's Musa says she sells between 50 to 300 items a month. Most of her clients are based in Bangladesh, but she also has customers in the US, UK, UAE and Europe. I have a lot of dreams, a lot of ambitions to take my brand internationally. If I could represent Bangladesh on the global platform, it would be an honor. I believe one day everybody will know about Bangladeshi fashion. It might take some time before Bangladeshi fashion labels are as well known as the country's ready-made garments. That sector accounts for 84% of exports, according to McKinsey. For the past half century, this industry helped transform Bangladesh into one of the world's fastest growing economies. But designers like Musa represent what the next 50 years might look like. Entrepreneurs who are putting their own twist on tradition. Men and women who are building on the country's rich history in order to secure a brighter future. There were those who said it was a dream. And yet, independence made the dream come true. Today, in the biggest delta on Earth, one of the fastest growing GDPs is a reality. Because here, medicine, food and garments for the world are made. For the year of the Golden Jubilee celebration of independence, the dream has never been more real. Because dreams are made in Bangladesh.